I'm Greg Lindquist. I've been training 55 years as of this year. My teacher was Seiya Oyata, and I was his student from 1968 until he passed in 2012, and I've maintained training since then. And I run an organization now called the Zensekai Karate in uh, Kobujitsu Rime. A small organization, but we uh, enjoy training in martial arts and uh, weapons training and karate training. And pretty much I try to do things uh, the old way to keep the old traditions going. Uh, my teacher was very traditional, yet he was a very modern man also. I was 19 years old and I uh, took a semester in college, had to go back and work to make money for, to go back to college. So. Uh, friends of my family ran a gas station in a small town in Kansas called Olathe, Kansas. So I was working there, and uh, one day this uh, man brings his poster by. His name was uh, Wallace Nicholson. He was a Green Beret that was stationed in Okinawa. Uh, brought a poster by for karate training. Wonder if he could put it up in the gas station. I go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know. Oh, you should come down there. And I'm, oh, yeah, okay. You know like we would say. So later, uh, either that day or the next day, I saw this man walking. Now this is 1968 in a small town in Kansas, walking with a full kimono and gaita on, cigarette hanging out of his mouth back then. And I go, whoa, what's that, you know? So uh, later on, he came by the gas station, he had different clothes on, of course, and said, uh, you come dojo. And I went, well, what? And he pointed to the poster. So, so like any inquisitive young guy, you know, I, uh, I went down there. And uh, the rest is kind of history. So I, uh, uh, they didn't really know how to get students. I, I could say this. It's kind of humorous right now. So I went in there and they put the bogo gear on me and just beat me up, you know. And uh, it's a wonder I went back, but I did. I thought, well, there's something special about this. So I, I, I really did. I went back, and the rest is history now. So, so um, they had rented this old rundown garage and didn't have much equipment, you know, and it was very primitive, but there was something about him and his teaching method personality that I liked. So... So as, as more I got into it, I've always been kind of a, a little bit of a history buff, and I've liked understanding where things come from. So I was very much interested in his culture. And uh, he didn't speak very good English at first, and we managed, and he got better and better. Training was seven days a week. And in that year, I only missed two days. Uh, once I was real sick, and I mean real sick, and... Uh, and second was, it was Christmas. And he was there a little over a year and he had to return back to Okinawa because his family got, uh, his son got injured and he had to go back. So I visited Okinawa in 1975. We stayed in communication. And then he returned back in 77. And uh, the training ever since, you know, I, I was with him from, I first trained with him till he passed in 2012. I used to travel a lot with him at first. I was the person responsible for introducing him to people. And this was a unique experience. And then also we, you know, established, at, before he came back, we established a martial arts supply business. I ran it, and I got to meet other martial artists. So it really expanded my knowledge of other arts and respect for other people. And uh, um, so that, that really helped me understand things. So this has been just a, such a great journey. Um, I think martial artists should be uh, kind to each other and respectful. And, but also, you know, when you, people need help, we help each other and help each other get better. So I, that's a very important uh, thing to do. So uh, training, um, you know, like anything, we, ha we specialize in different things. So uh, ho hopefully specialize. So um, I had a kind of a fondness for the comma, for training of the comma. So I liked that, and he saw something in me. So we really spent a lot of time on comma training. So 
Well, originally, you know, he was careful. He didn't teach too much when I first got here. So he was basically learning kata and then putting the boga gear on and beating each other to death, <laughs> practically. And then doing some uh, tweet there, some grabbing technique. And uh, I was usually on the receiving end of that, of course, you know. So, so, um, so as time went on and after he came back, we got uh, more and more people to join. He was actually satisfied just teaching a few of us. And we had the martial arts business. He would help us, like, make things. We made our own uniforms and stuff like that. And, um, and, and we started making weapons and things. So uh, I think he was happy. And, you know, I went to him one day and I said, um, what you're teaching won't fit in my head. We need more people, you know. And then we started doing that, you know. I was just kind of joking with him about that. But, but actually, he, uh, he said, okay, you know. And uh, we had already some other people. Um, Jim Logan, South Carolina was one. Uh, and, and Albert Giraldi in New York was another. And when we first started, that we made a small organization. And, and um, especially after he left, you know, I met these guys. And, uh, and, and you know, we tried, to, and so when he came back, there was a small organization for him. And then as time went on, it grew. He was a very, very good technician. And um, uh, when he'd go around and show people, and I went around with him the first few years, almost everywhere he went. And um, being the uke is very painful, but uh, as we all know, as being martial artists, yeah, it's part of, the, part of the game. You know, you have to feel pain and feel technique, you know. I knew the man. I wasn't scared of him. But you have so much respect. And since he hurt me a lot, you know, I mean, not really hurt me. But, of course, we had a few accidents, you know. I used to joke I was the king of the knockout club, you know. I, I went with him everywhere, and he, uh, you know, used me most of the time. And then one of the best things to me after I got in my 40s, he said, well, I'm going to do it less on you. <laughs> i got some younger guys now. You know, so age is, is something, you know, that's important. But to me, feeling the technique and, and, and stuff. So, you know, uh, as he told me, he said, killing's very easy, but controlling is more difficult. And so, like, knocking out isn't that you're they're out and they can't do anything, it's that you have total control of them. So you don't have to go out all the way, and you don't really want that because then you gotta wake them up. And that can be a problem. So the idea is to stun the person, and so they don't really know how, uh, I mean, or what happened to them, and then they're, you know, the room's doing this, hopefully. So I think it's kind of a unique experience to feel that. Um, another story I have when um, Dr. Chris Huppert showed up to, uh, to our dojo in the late 70s, and he was a PhD of anatomy. So I knew when he walked in, I was in trouble, of course, that day, you know. So he wanted to show him technique, you know. So he told me to punch at him. So when he said punch, he really means it, not just, you know, okay, it's like really punching at him. So he hit me in the arm here. And I just remember waking up. I mean, and this is what they told me would happen. He hit me on the arm. I collapsed. I tried to get up, and I kept collapsing down. And I moved over and curled up like a fetal position. So Dr. Hubbard is going, hey, wow, that's pretty neat. You know, being a martial artist, we'd say that, you know. So uh, <clears throat> I, I had no idea what happened. He had to tell me. And this is what he said. I know what he did, but I don't know how he did it. And here's a PhD talking, see. So this was a unique experience that we had to understand. So he, this is what, you know, um, my studies were. Understand the human body, how it works. You don't want your opponent to see your breathing. So you hear all these people doing kata and they make a lot of noise and exhale, you know, all this. And I think that's not really good because you don't want your opponent to know you're breathing. As anybody knows, when, when can you strike? 
see? You take a breath, now, now you hit, see? So if you exhale a lot, you can't do anything. So just by knowing. So I, I thought an uh, interesting thing was the fact that he liked people that had mustaches and beards because you could see that. To me, this is knowledge is, is what we're getting in the martial arts. And, uh, um, and I'm not perfect, and I'm still training and still learning, and um, no one can know it all. Uh, when it comes to the weapons and everything, proper use of them is very important and understanding them. You know, a bow is six foot long, but it's not a six foot weapon. It's only a three foot weapon because you have to hold it and that's all you have to strike with. A Joe or a Yon Choco bow is four feet. Here again, it's another three foot weapon because you have to hold it. Now this a uh, rook shock at a six foot, you can't hold it on the end and use it. It's very difficult. There's some techniques. So you have to hold it up, so that's the three feet. And uh, the yon shoko or the joe, you can hold it at l lower end, you still have the three feet, you see. So they're very similar things. So then it comes to the smaller, the hand weapons, sai, uh, everything else like that knowing how to use those properly because the bow was kind of the king of the kobujitsu. It's not that it's better, it's the common denominator. It was the common thing and it was used to gauge other things. So you always used to see years ago, bow versus sai, bow versus tonfa, you know, bow versus bow because that was the common thing. and. Uh, whatever talent was, you know. So it's much difficult if you have a side and a guy's got a bow. You really got to know your stuff. See? That's, sometimes they use two because that would age you. See? So I think this is important. And also the tombow we use is very important. I feel that is because it's easy to find that. You know, side other things, you have to have a blacksmith or a metal person make these. A bow, for a bow, you need a long piece of wood. A tombow is two feet long. You can find that, you know. I mean, imagine yourself in a forest. You need something. You can find a two-foot, you know, it may not be straight, but it would be pretty, pretty straight. So to me, that is the um, easiest thing to find. Uh, so if you had to teach a mass of people, that would be a very common thing. And, and I, I like the techniques very much. So, so... In the system, uh, we use the, we have the Kazushikata. The Kazushikata from the Ugushiku family was, I think, very unique and very important. And it has a lot of the Tachiage type motions, um, very f uh, beautiful moves. And I think it's important, so that's why I use this, this to honor my teacher and his teachers. So I think that's, that's really important to do. Um, so, but we have a Kazushi uh, Kama and Kazushi Tambo. Uh, I think I know like 29 weapons for them, which is really too much. <laughs> but just to learn to pass them on, I can't perfect them myself, you know. So different people hopefully will pick up different, different ones and pass them on. Because things are too valuable to lose. Um, this, these are very, very old art. And I think they need to be passed down to the next generations. Sometimes he would talk about the war not too much because it was a terrible thing. So he had lost th his three brothers. He was the last one. And the police came to his parents' house and said, we're taking your son. And his dad said, you're not taking my last son. You already got three of them, you know. And uh, so... They said, then you go to jail. And the dad goes to jail, you know, because the Japanese, uh, you know, needed people. So he told his dad he would go. And he went into Navy, the Navy, and, uh, excuse me here, and uh, he 
uh, had that training and the you know, lot, lot of martial arts training in that, you know, as far as uh, judo and eido and and uh, spear training and uh, yadi and uh, the bayonet training and all that. And uh, these were just young kids, and and he did the, all that and. He was supposed to be in the Kai Ten, you know, the one one way tor uh, torpedo kind of. And he he told me they would weld you in it and gave you enough gas for one way and air, you know. So, uh, and I've seen pictures of him. I understand. So this was, you know, a suicide thing. So uh, it's hard to believe people can do that, you know. For for my generation, it's very difficult. So, you know, that was a terrible experience. They were in the Philippines, and, and luckily for us, they got captured before he had to go out. He was scheduled for like a week. And the U.S. invaded the Philippines, and, and uh, they had to scatter in the hills, and everybody all got captured. And, and, uh, and that was a tough thing. And, you know, they got the Philippine people stoned them and everything. So, I mean, you know, he's, he's a POW, in other words, at that point. You know, he was um, supposed to go out in the Kai Tan, and he was scheduled for a week, and then they had already sent the death certificate to his family. So they thought he was gone. So when he returned, evidently communication wasn't great, that his mother was surprised because she hadn't seen him in, you know, two or three years or more. I don't know how, many, how long it was. And... She looked behind to see if he left footprints because ghosts, she thought it was a ghost. So we got back to Okinawa and then you get back to your, your home and there's hardly any buildings left, you know. Completely bombed. A very terrible part to go to. And he said, you know, he almost became a Yakuza because that was the only way to make money. His dad was very strong and I guess talked him out of it and then and that's when he got a job for the American, taking food around. And we met his teacher, so then that helped him. But he went through some terrible, terrible things. You know, like I'm sure other Okinawans can attest to. It made his character very strong. And uh, also I think his family. His, his dad was some type of sumo champion in Okinawa, uh, their, their version of it. Uh, I think from his high school or something. So. Uh, I think he had a pretty tough family he came from. So, but he was, um, you know, uh, uh, a very interesting man. Uh, he was a very good man, but he had flaws like everyone, don't we all? When my teacher met his teachers, which was a unique story too, you know, he worked for the American government taking food around after the war. He had the amphibious vehicles, the ones that land and water. And, you know, he saw the older man, and is 90-some years old, in this town and, and tried to befriend him, give him food, and he wouldn't take it. He kept at it and kept at it. And finally, he saw him one day out fishing, and the, and the old man says, hey, you can take me fishing. Okay, so I took him fishing. Then you're alone in the, on the ocean, and you can talk, and that's what happened. And they called him uh, Kamotambe. So they had his hair back like you weren't supposed to have those here illegal, you know. They were like the warrior style. So when, he, when we met him, you know, then he realized from the name who he was, the Tukushku family. Uh, and we believe they were the sleeping quarters guards and the side gate guards. And I always wondered why the side gate, but then that's how the king would enter. You don't go through the front door, you know. The one question he asked him, what is your blood line? So, you know, warrior class people, this was important. So Oyata Sensei was from the Zana, the Vekata or Oyakata line. So, you know, he could teach him like, evidently. So so that rest is history now. So he he got to learn from this man and he learned weapons. And he said, Why would I learn weapons first? And it was because he said, I'm old and I'll die soon. Some of these will die with me. So this was an important thing. Uh, he told me one thing about it. it. He was like my size for Okinawa, and I was large at that time. And he said, if he did, the, 
if his teacher held his hand up, he had to go this way to be the same thickness. So I think a lot of the warrior class were big, big, large people. And then Oyarat Sensei told me he went to his family tomb and looked it up, and he said uh, the bones were very large. You know, they used to wash the bones, put them in. And he said, yeah, they were larger, larger people. So uh, possibly this is a, a key to that. Uh, Ugush Kutame, I think, had other students. I know he had one of the students, probably others, but they probably got killed in the war. So, so I think that Oyasensi Sensei was kind of his last student that he had. Ugush Kutame explained to him about the grabbing technique and the vital points and everything, and how important. So when he met Wakinaguri, his friend, that's what he was all about, uh, Wakinaguri and uh, from a Gina area, he was Chinese descent, and uh, he had all the Q show and everything. So, as he told us, it looked like his fingers were all the same length and no fingernails. So you start the Chinese training a young kid. And he said, you know, if he touched you, you were like on fire, he knew everything, you know. We think this was like more of an assassin type, you know, this type of skill he had that it was, um, very unique, and that they were friends. Probably they were had some family uh, type s similar jobs, maybe working in the castle, government, for the king, or what have you. So uh, this tradition lives on. So it's just speculation, of course, but we're pretty sure that's possibly what happened. So. Um, he showed him that understand the human body, how it works. It was very much a part of Chinese martial arts also. So he got to learn with these guys. They kind of shared him, I think. I think they had fun. They were friends and, and all this. So I think that was kind of a unique thing that he got to train in. And, and then, of course, you know, they were older when they passed. And 1950s came around. And, uh, you know, and then he had to see other people. He went out and trained. And, and he said from his teachers, they told him how to train. And what I feel I'm lucky at, he taught me how to analyze what I'm doing. And, and to me, this is a great gift. So um, to be able to look at kata and say, I think it means this. And, and out there, to me, there's so many people, uh, and I don't want to say anything negative about anyone, but... I don't think they quite get what the content does, you know, because it's, 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 it's not common, you know. He, he told me this about when he taught in the United States. He says, Westerners have this feeling, I'm going to do this, this, and this to my opponent. He says, I look at it, he says, if I do this, he's going to do this, so I have to do that. So he's always a step or two ahead of the situation. It's a different how the, uh, the uh, different people look at how technique is. So it's not what I can do to my opponent. It's what can I get done when he reacts to me. You know, so it's kind of like a slingshot. You pull it back, it's going to go that way real fast. So you have to understand that, you know. So there's um, principles of, of technique. And I tell people, there's three ways you can be attacked. Striking is one. That's punching, kicking, using a weapon, you know, whatever. You know, jumping off on someone. That could be amazing, you know. That's all under the striking category. Then the number two is they'll grab you followed up usually with a strike. And number three is you'll be pushed. Here again, probably followed up with some kind of striking. Unless they push you down and they can probably stomp on you or something. So, so um, these are all dangerous situations. Martial arts is not easy. It's a very difficult road, but it's very rewarding. But it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of uh, understanding, a lot, a lot of education, 
and um, a lot of practice and uh, a lot of failures along the way. So we failed and we get better. We don't do it again. So uh, I think it's important to understand the weakness of the human body and the strengths of the body. Now, does the body do things that are weird? Yes, you know. Uh, like I said, when I got knocked out the, uh, and by, by my arm, <clears throat> I kept trying to get up and I kept passing out. Well, that was the body protecting itself, you know, because my blood pressure was too low. Um, what happens if your arm gets cut off? The body puts more blood there. So it does some good things and it does things they're not quite sure of, why it happens. But as a practical thing, a martial artist, we have to train well and try to understand what we're doing, uh, stay principled and stay to the old teachings and uh, respect what, what that is so, so our technique is really special. So um, one thing we always said, you know, that I'm responsible for my opponent also. If I have to defend myself and I hurt that person, their life is in my hands. So I want to make sure if they fall, they don't kill themselves. That they're not too injured, you know. I can control them and wait for police to come or what have you. Also, we need to understand we have to, to protect ourselves. We also protect ourselves from the law. We're within the law, but I don't want to get... If I defend myself and I get arrested, then something's wrong. I want to be able to defend myself and the police understand I did the proper thing, you know. If the police come and they say, well, I, I hit him in the mouth and his mouth's bleeding. Well, what did he do to you? Well, he swung at me. Well, where's your proof? So I get in trouble because he's bleeding, you see. So that's why we like vital point training and stuff. It does a show. And <laughs> it's internal. Uh, it usually does a show. It bruises, of course, you know. Um, but it's internal. And the people, you can hurt them without hurting them too much. So I think that's, that's very important. What do you, how much do you teach people? Of course, well, uh, Karate has always been, I check their character out first, you know. But all of us know, you've known someone a long time, and all of a sudden, they change. And uh, so we really have to check the character. And um, it, it, you are teaching a dangerous thing to people. They can easily hurt somebody bad. So I, I think, you know, by training hard and training properly, it gets people in the right state of mind also. Because mental... Illness and mental problems is, goes along with everything in life, you know. So, and a lot of people train to fight depression or what have you, and that's a good thing. And we have to see that in people. So, but I know what you mean. It, it can be, you know, it just simple punching can kill someone. So we have to be careful how we do that. So that's the first thing we do check is a person's character. So my thoughts on the future are uh, kind of a hard thing to say because, you know, I hope the future is, is peaceful for everyone. But um, it's to keep, keep training and keep teaching. Hope we can spread the technique and the kata and the weapons more in different countries. I have very good people that are helping me. I think that's a very important subject to do. And so the camaraderie and the brotherhood and... Uh, um, the respect, as I've talked before about, we want to keep going, and uh, in general education of the arts. And I want to make karate something that everyone's proud of, and I hope, hope the future is good for all of us. <laughs>